All right. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles should come to, shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together and they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy. Because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you, the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover the land, and dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All from Seba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nib, excuse me, Nebola shall minister to you. They shall send, uh, they shall ascend with acceptance on my altar. I will glorify the house of my glory. Lord, we come to you with praises and thanksgiving. Lord, thank you that you uh, are, are shining upon us. Thank you, Father God, for answers to prayer, Lord God. And we gather together, Lord God, rejoicing at who you are, Lord God. We rejoice at, uh, uh, that you are mindful of us. We rejoice that uh, uh, what you have accomplished for all mankind. And Lord, this morning, we dedicate ourselves and we dedicate ourselves individually and as a, uh, as a church to you, Lord God. We desire and seek to glorify your holy name. And only your holy name do we uh, desire to see, to glorify in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. And those out there in Facebook land, we're going to give you guys an opportunity to get your, um, your cup and your juice. But while we are doing that, I want to share a testimony. So two weeks ago, I went to see Bob Vandermeer. Van Marley. I keep saying it the wrong way. But I went to see him, and he couldn't speak well. And I leaned in a little close to him to try to understand and make out what he was saying, and I couldn't. And, and, I, and I felt like Bob was saying, get your hair out my face. You know, so I, I removed myself, and then um, I just prayed with him, and I told him then, I said, Bob, I'm just going to join in with the prayers that Pastor Oz, Pastor John, Pastor Bird and all the other pastors and the church has prayed over you. And, and so I began to pray. And, and then I left. And so I went this Friday. And there was a nurse in the room with him. And she was um, getting him together and she was asking him. She said, so, and Cindy, I hope this is okay with you. I love you. But she was asking him how, um, she said, when did you get married? And he said, in 1935. And, and she said to him, she said, you couldn't have got married in 1935. You were born in 59. And so I'm standing out there, and I'm laughing like, well, that's what you get for waking him up. That's what I was thinking. But then as I was sharing this with Cindy, and Cindy said, no, we've been married 35 years. So you see how one flesh, that flesh just put it all together. And then when I was... Pastor John came up here. Pastor Cindy sitting next to me. She said, oh, he has something on him. And she got, and now I'm sitting right there. I don't see it. And she got up and he had a little tag and she took it off. 
And I'm like, the power of one flesh. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. And I hope, and this, this week when I went to say, see Bob, he was talking. He said, where's my wife? Then when I named all the people that was praying for him, he said, wow, that's a lot of people. And I said, yes. I said, we love you. And then he said, well, I'm going to pray too. So he began to pray too. So it was really beautiful, and I, and I thank God for what God is doing. I understand that there are some things that are still going on, but that's all right. We'll keep praying. So um, now I want to go to John chapter 6 and verse 25. Now these are the disciples looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the low of the loaves. Do you not work for your food that perishes, for the food that endures to eternal life, which is the Son of Man will give you, give to you. For on him God the Father has sent this seal. Then they said to him, "What must we do to to um, what must we do to be doing the works of God?" Jesus answered them, "This is the works of God that you believe in Him who has been sent." So they said to him, "Then what signs do you do that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform?" Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say unto you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, the bread of heaven to my fathers, but my father gave them the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes from heaven and gave his life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread. Always. They wanted always. Now nah, they greedy. Jesus said to them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jesus made me like this. He already know. Jesus said, <laughs> Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whatever believe and wait a minute. And the bread of life, whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that have seen me and yet do not believe, all the um, Father gives me will come to you, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but, to, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that has been given me, but raise up, I like, raise up on that last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled. That's what we do. We complain when we don't get things our way. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life who came down from heaven. They said, is not this the Jesus, the son of Joseph, who father and mother we knew? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourself. Do not. No one can come to the. Um, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except me, whom is from God. He has said 
He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whosoever believes believe has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your father ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now the Jews disputed among themselves and saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly I say unto you, unless you can eat my flesh, the, the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the, day, on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. What, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father." So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue, and he taught in communion. Remember, we're doing this in remembrance of who you are, Father God remembering of the sacrifice that you made to examine ourselves, Lord, that we, Father God, whatever sin may be there, that you remove it. Whatever stagnates us, Father God, and keep us from moving and flowing in the ways you want us to, remove it. For the community to unite us, Father God, unite us as we proclaim the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world. We trust in you, Lord. And for that, we partake. We thank you, Lord, for the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, for your blood. And Lord, as we prepare for the rest of our service, Lord, what we have just partaken of, Father God, we, we consume the body and the blood of Jesus. Let the word, Father God, that's been to come forth, let it penetrate our very existence, Lord, that we, Father God, begin to be mature Christians, walking in the faith in unity. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to welcome our brother, James Johnston, Jr. JR is here with us. Hallelujah. <laughs> Rob, uh, the way Rob was sharing I formulated in my mind, in the midst of tribulation, we find that very affliction and suffering punctuated by miracles of Jesus. And we thank the Lord for JR. And we thank the Lord for many other miracles. We also, uh, I was talking to Lisa last week, and we thank the Lord for Donovan and all the things that the Lord is doing. Two of our men just in horrible crashes. And God just spared them and is raising them back up miraculously. Thank you, Jesus. All right. We are going to turn once again to the book of Revelation. We're looking at the church in Philadelphia, which is apparently going to take a lot longer than I thought originally, but there's a lot there. And the Lord is just speaking to us. So, the church in Philadelphia, Revelation 3, verse 7, it's one of the seven churches. Each of those churches is empowered by a vision of Jesus. Each of those churches is walking in the outpouring of the Spirit of God that comes from 
encountering the Lord, having the Lord unveiled. Uh, each one of those churches is encouraged to be an overcomer, a conqueror, a victor in the midst of the very difficult situations that the body of Christ was facing there as we're on just around 70 AD, some 40 years after Jesus lived and taught, moved in the power of the Spirit, was crucified, died, buried, raised from the dead, spent 40 days and 40 nights raised from the dead, instructing the disciples in their apostolic pursuit of the kingdom that would take place shortly, followed by the ascension of Jesus, and then 10 days later, the outpouring of the Spirit. And now 40 years later, 40 years later, uh, the church is in very difficult times, but the Lord always provides. He provides us. He imparts to us a, a strength by bringing us to a place we've never been, and it's a place of, of seeing him in his glory. That's what empowers us. It's his grace that creates the faith within us, that creates a new consciousness in us of who he is and that imparts to us a, a new anointing, a new power to go forth and face what we need to face. Face something that's beyond us, something that's more powerful than us, something that is seeking to destroy us, but in the freshness of Jesus coming and saying, behold, I'm with you. Fear not, behold, I'm with you. And coming in our midst and raising us up, we move forth to conquer. Now, Philadelphia is just one of the seven churches, but each one essentially is the same. They are empowered by a vision of Jesus, and we've been talking about that the past few weeks. Revelation 3, 7 says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, the interesting thing is, is to remember Philadelphia, that's a, that's a pure Greek word, and it, it's love of the brethren is what Philadelphia means. Um, it, it's a combination of uh, philia and adelphos. Adelphos meaning brethren, family, kin, and philia meaning love. The, and that's the particular a Greek word for love that has to do with the bonding of family members, the, the love that we have uh, that makes us uh, not only family members but makes us friends. It's, it's the love that companions have for each other. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful love. And so the church is named after that and apparently the Lord is calling it into that love because as verse 9 says, uh, the Lord is going to cause those who have opposed this church uh, to know that Jesus has loved that church. And so they become, in, in, in the love of Jesus for them, they become empowered to love their brethren and to be a testimony toward that end. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, verse 7, these things says he who is holy, he who is true. And we've been, we've been looking at that the past few weeks. What does that mean? He who is holy and he who is true. What kind of implications does that have for the church? In Philadelphia, the church in the book of Revelation. Well, it is the revelation of Jesus' holiness, the revelation of Jesus' truth, that leads to the third aspect of the vision of Jesus, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, that speaks of authority. Jesus has the key to lock things up, and when he locks them up, they're not going to get unlocked, and he has the power and the authority to unlock things, and when he unlocks them, no one's going to lock that back up. No one can close that door. So 
It's the holiness and the truth of Jesus, seeing him as the holy one, seeing him as the true one, that gives us authority to unlock doors that are locked and to lock doors that are unlocked so that the purposes of the Lord might be fulfilled. So I want to continue with this idea of, of the holy one and the true one, and then perhaps next week we can get to the keys, the, the, this real understanding of the keys of the kingdom that is given to Philadelphia, is given to the body of Christ as well. So I want to go the same place we've gone the last two weeks. The other place where we see holy and true combined, the only other place where we see them combined in a single phrase in the book of Revelation is Revelation 6, verse 10. Now remember what the holy and true one does. He empowers God's people to be witnesses to Jesus, to bear witness to Jesus. And to bear witness to Jesus means to be a martyr. Uh, and again, that's the actual term in the Greek. A martyr is, is one who is a witness. He's a, he, it's one who bears witness in court. It's one who, who stands and speaks the truth so that people understand what is really going on in this particular situation that's been brought to the attention of the judge. In this case, the judge, of course, is the judge of all the earth. He's the, the judge of all the earth, and Jesus, of course, is the one that we're bearing witness to. And the judge of the whole earth is watching the church, watching the body of Christ, bearing witness that Jesus is the holy one and Jesus is the true one. And so this passage in Revelation 6.10, it's the fifth seal uh, of the seven seals, uh, that seal up the inheritance document of the kingdom, and Jesus is loosening those seals. The Lamb is loosening those seals so that the church can enter into her inheritance. And her inheritance is that she has a vision of Jesus as an, and is empowered with the authority to be an overcomer, to get the victory, to be the one who conquers, not the one who is conquered, because we know, of course, the book of Revelation speaks of all kinds of forces of spiritual warfare that seeks to conquer the church. But the church isn't going to be conquered. The church is going to be the conquerors, and they're going to be that because of this, this vision of Jesus that fuels them and motivates them onward and empowers them. So when the fifth seal is broken, and these are all things, when, when you look at the seven seals biblically, these are all things that take place when the church is receiving her inheritance. In other words, when the church comes back from exile and receives her inheritance, when the church uh, enters into the, the year of Jubilee, and when the year of Jubilee is over and debts are canceled and 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 poverty is eliminated and slavery is abolished, God's people receive their inheritance. So when you, when you look at those seven seals, you need to understand it from that standpoint. These are the things that must take place in order for the church to receive its inheritance. And one of the things that happens, and remember by this particular time, this 40-year this year stretch in, in New Testament history between Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and sending the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, and where the church is now, in that 40-year period, Christians have been martyred, have died, have been executed, have lost their lives, and are being martyred at this particular time. So, you know, this is a church, obviously, that finds herself in danger, uh, a kind of a danger on a, on a, on a larger scale than, than they've ever experienced. I mean, we know quite quickly after the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus, who, by the way, is the, what? The first martyr. Jesus is the first martyr, and Jesus shows that the way we gain victory over the enemies of God that seek to hinder the purposes of the Lord is by martyrdom. 
Jesus is martyred, and because Jesus is martyred, the beast of the Roman Empire, the false prophet of, of, of civil religion and, and, and the religion of Israel that rejected Jesus and, and the great harlot, these, the, the, the seduction of mammon and wealth, uh, they've already come very quickly after Jesus has died and raised from the dead and we know Stephen is martyred. <laughs> And, and interestingly enough, the, the person in charge of Stephen's martyr, Paul, <laughs> gets converted to Jesus after he participates in the martyrdom of Stephen. And as we've quoted Eugenio Corsini many times uh, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, the Lord gets vengeance on his enemies by converting them. That's what happens with Paul. Paul is out to destroy the church. In fact, it's on his way to do further, uh, wreak further havoc on the church shortly after the uh, martyrdom of Stephen that Paul on the road to Damascus, and he's going there, he's got letters from the high priest that he can do what he wants with those heretical Christians and their, their Jesus the Messiah talk. And we know, of course, Jesus appears to him and says, okay, Stop. Stop on the way to Damascus. Listen, Paul. I know, well, Saul, he's saying, because his name was Saul. He was, Paul was his, uh, was his Roman name. Saul was his Jewish name. And that's pretty interesting. The guy named Saul, who was the first king of Israel, who got disqualified uh, and was replaced by David. Now, now the, the Saul here, who, who put Stephen to death, is going to be disqualified, but he's going to be requalified as, a, as an apostle of Jesus. And he says, Saul, um, listen, and I, I know you just martyred my apostolic witness, Stephen, my son, and uh, I know you're on your way to do some more damage to Damascus, but I'm here to set you free and give you good news. And the good news is now you're not going to martyr my people. You're going to become a martyr for me. That's the good news of the apostolic call. And, and, and we know early on, too, James, the brother of, of John, is martyred in the book of Acts. So it's, it's been going on from, from day one in the church, but it's kind of exploding right now on a level they've never seen when the prophecy of Revelation comes forth. So you need to appreciate the context. The church is a little worried right now. You know, they're, 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 they're worried because they're in a, a dangerous situation. They've never found us and, and uh, they've never found themselves before. And while it's not that I want to equate what we're going through now with what they were going through then, but I am equating it because as we know, uh, martyrdom is up in the world. I quote this one just about every week, too, that there have been more martyrs in the 20th and the 21st century than all the martyrs in church history put together. So we're in a similar place. But see, it's Jesus to the rescue. The Lord never requires something of his church that he himself doesn't provide the grace to carry out. So whatever we face the last year and a half, God has given us grace to deal with it. Whatever we may face the next year and a half, God will give us grace. See, that's what it means to hope on the Lord, to wait on the Lord, to hope on the Lord, to trust on the Lord, is not to look at the future and get all worried about it. It's to remember that when the future comes, we'll be ready for the future because Jesus will reveal himself. And see, that's what grace really is. Grace isn't, you know, the force be with you kind of thing. I mean, it, it, it is a kind of a power, a divine power outside of us that, that, that comes into us and empowers us. But rather, grace is what we receive when Jesus unveils himself to us, when Jesus reveals himself to us.
whether he reveals himself to us when we're worshiping him, whether he reveals himself to us in a, a, a proclamation of scripture, whether he reveals himself to us when we're praying, whether he reveals himself to us when we're by ourselves, or whether he reveals himself to us when we're together. Jesus appears. He's unveiled. We see something of him we've never seen, and that kind of, of, of supernatural strength and supernatural supply that we really, we can feel it coming into us. We can feel it coming on us. We can feel it changing our minds. We can feel it changing our hearts. We can feel it causing us to re reconfigure the world around us according to God's purposes. That's grace. See, that's grace. And it, grace always comes when the Holy Spirit takes us into the presence of Jesus and then unveils it. Or when the Holy Spirit takes us into the presence of Jesus and says, remember what he said, and he speaks that word to us. Or when the Holy Spirit just, just quickens us to perform miracles. That's grace. So the fifth seal's broken. Verse 9, and John sees under the altar... Remember, he's caught up into heaven at this point. And see, what's going on in heaven, remember, heaven is the um, <clears throat> antitype of the earthly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary with its altars and its, its holy place and its holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim, the glory of God, the altar of incense, the altar of, of sacrifice, the table of, of the bread. Uh, all of these, these things, the lampstands, the menorah, all of those things are the type. They're a configuration, a, a symbol, a, a, a real tangible symbol, a picture that shows us what heaven is really like. It's... it's you know, we're constructing all these things on earth. Israel constructed all those things on earth because that's the plan that the Lord gave Moses in the mountain. He said, now I want you to do this. You know, I want you to do this brazen altar and there's, there's going to be a bronze laver. You know, you're going to wash yourself in it. And there's going to be an altar where you sacrifice the animals and then you're going to collect the blood of those animals and then you're going to bring them into the into the holy place and there's the menorah and this is what I want the menorah is you know it's it's the the candle with with seven lamps coming out of a center candle there's a center candle in the midst and then there are three branches on either side and so you have seven it's a tree the menorah is a picture of the tree of life and see life and light are related you light the tree, the tree is life, and the life is light. In him was light, and the light shone in the darkness. In him was life, and the light shone in the darkness. Life and light are connected in, in the, the, the temple imagery, the temple symbolism, because when we see him, that's what light is, Life is imparted to us. Grace is imparted to us. So your answer to every, every problem in your life, every difficulty, every struggle, every hindrance, every question, every confusion, the answer is really the same. See, pastoring is actually really easy. Wow, that pastor Oz, to be a pastor, man, he, that guy is so smart. Heck no, it's easy. You don't have to be smart to be a pastor. The answer to the same is the same thing. You need to see Jesus. Oh, you have a problem in your life. You need to see Jesus. You have confusion. You need to see Jesus. If there's warfare coming against you. You need to see Jesus. You're afraid about everything that's going on. You need to see Jesus. We need healing of, of these broken relationships. Well, you need to see Jesus. It's a simple answer because light, seeing Jesus, creates life. 
and life. It's the tree of life. It's eternal life. Whether we partake of the bread and the cup that is his body and his blood, and now we have eternal life in us, or we see him unveiled, he imparts life to us. With you is the tree of life, and in your light we see light. I mean, there's scriptures. Life and light are related all throughout scripture. And then there's the altar of incense, and that's, that's the prayer of the saints. There's the table of bread there. Well, that's that the Lord feeds us. Then there's the Ark of the Covenant. Well, when John is caught up to heaven, he, these things, he, it's all there. It's there in heaven. There's an altar. And see, the altar... This is, this is the altar of sacrifice, not the altar of incense. The altar of sacrifice is in the fifth seal, the altar of incense. They were two separate altars. The altar of incense is, is in the, with the seventh seal when the bulls are tipped from heaven and the prayer of the saints ascends to heaven like incense and tips the bulls. But it was interesting, it was like the, the, fire, the coals from the fire of the altar of sacrifice was what lit the incense in the altar of incense. And see the blood, the blood of the animals that was shed in the altar of sacrifice outside of the holy place then is carried into the holy of holies and, and, and you know the different things are anointed with the blood. So he sees his fifth seal open and he saw under the altar, just as Jesus was the first martyr and was, was offered on God's altar as a sacrifice for us that we might enter in behind the veil, that we might go into the holy place which only the priests had access and we could go into the holy of holies which only the high priest had access or as you know, Neil Silverberg talks, it's, 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 it might be the opposite. It isn't that we go in, it's that God gets out. You know, when the, when the veil is rent, we can go in, but when the veil's rent, God can get out of there and say, I don't have to be confined to this little room, okay, called the Holy of Holies anymore. I can go out and walk in the midst of my people because they're purified by the blood of the first martyr. But here's the interesting thing about the book of Revelation. And see, the book of Revelation, it's talking about the completion of the ministry of Christ th through and by the church. See, Jesus sets the, the, the kingdom reality into motion with his shed blood, and then Hebrews says that Jesus took his own shed blood and he, he took it to heaven and he brought it into the heavenly sanctuary, the antitype, the, the, the real sanctuary that's in heaven that John is seeing now when he's caught up to heaven, which all those temples and tabernacles on earth are just a pattern of. It says Jesus took his blood into the holy of holies in heaven and purged it. See, see, see we get in because of Jesus, God gets out because of Jesus. But it's very interesting. The Lord sets all of this, these kingdom purposes in motion on the earth, but then the church completes that work. Not salvifically, but eschatologically. Remember, we've been telling there's a difference. Jesus alone is responsible for salvation, but we participate with Jesus for eschatology. In other words, salvation is... We can't get in and God can't get out without Jesus. We can't be righteous without Jesus. We can't see the Lord without Jesus. We can't even be brothers and sisters with each other because uh, apart from Jesus. It's, it's Jesus. But, remember Daniel 7, the Son of Man gets the kingdom. He's the one who gets it. He's the only one. He's the only one found worthy. He's the only one, these seven seals, John weeps because, you know, there's the kingdom document and all you got to do, the inheritance document, you got to break those seals. And once the seals are broken, then the, the will can be read. Oh, okay. 
All of God's people get this. But at the start of the breaking of the seven seals, which, you know, it's back in chapter 5 and chapter 6, earlier in 6 and, and, and late, later in chapter 5, who's gonna, who, who, who is worthy to break the seals and get the document read? Well, it's his will. He's the one who died so we get the inheritance from him, but for the first time in human history, the person who dies <laughs> reads the will and, and gives the inheritance to everybody. See how, I mean, just God is so cool, you know. God is cool. Well, Jesus died. We were hoping that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Who are you that you haven't heard of these things? You know, they're, they're talking to Jesus, on the, the raised Jesus on the road to Damascus. Well, Kent, who are you? Were you, like, born in a hole or something? <laughs> Jesus says, no, I died, and now I'm coming back to read the uh, terms of my will so all of you can get your inheritance. First, that's, there's so many firsts in human history that Jesus does, you know. You know, Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, that's the thing everybody forgets. Lazarus died. He was in the, great, the tomb for four days. Jesus raises him from the dead, but guys, Lazarus was going to, he died again, you know. He, he, he was going to die, you know, again. So Lazarus can't come back and read the will. Well, here's my will, and I'm back, because he's, he's alive again. There's no will of a dead man to... to to give to his heirs. But Jesus does that. Incredible. Who is worthy? No one. See, salvifically, in terms of salvation, no one is worthy. You can't save yourself. Never could. Never will be able to. You cannot do it. You cannot do anything that can get, gain God's approval, and the Lord says, well, stop. Oz did it, man. He saved himself. He doesn't need anyone else. No human being. See, it's all Jesus. So John's weeping because there's nobody worthy. And then, of course, the elders and the living creatures, these supernatural beings that have to do with guarding God's presence and worship. You know, the 24 elders before the throne, they're, what are the elders? They're priests who worship. And what are the living creatures? They're supernatural beings who guard the glory of God. They're cherubim, is what the four living creatures are. And where do we first see the cherubim? Well, Adam and Eve hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. And Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden and cherubim stand with a flaming sword, guarding the glory of God, guarding the new heavens and the new earth. And so cherubim take the place of human beings, guarding the glory of God. Well, so you have this whole worship and guarding the glory, and then they announce to John, oh, wait a second. There is no one worthy but the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain. He's worthy to open the scrolls, to break the seals and open the scroll. And Jesus starts doing it, and we get to the fifth seal here. Now keep in mind, book of Revelation is about now that second part of Daniel 7. The Son of Man alone gets the kingdom. But then what does he do in the seventh chapter of Daniel? He gives the kingdom to the saints of the Most High. And saints in Hebrew, that's the holy ones. Okay? Saints are the holy ones. Philadelphia sees the holy and the true one, and then they become holy ones or saints themselves, empowered by that vision of Jesus' holiness. And Jesus' holiness is this. I and I alone can do this. Nobody else can do this. I am other than all 
of my creation. No one, no thing, not the living creatures, not the 24 elders, not any human being, not the prophets, the apostles, the kings, the priests. Nobody can do it. See, that's what holiness is. Holiness is seeing him as the only one. And see, when you see him as the only one, the holy one, you become a saint. And this is what a saint, this is what constitutes sainthood. Sainthood is that Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, that's what makes a saint a saint. They're not out there performing. They're not out there trying to earn their way with God. They're not out there trying to become somebody, get a, a TV show on the satellite network. They're not out there trying to, you know, sit with the president and, 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 and somehow soak into the, the power of the most powerful man in the world. At least he was heading to where we're at now in America. If America, keep, uh, if America keeps going where it's going, America is not going to be the most powerful nation in the world anymore because a divided house cannot stand. And if the Democrats get what they want or the Republicans get what they want, they're not going to get what they want. See, the Lord catches the wise in their own craftiness because the only way they're going to get what they want is to become two separate nations. That is where we are headed. A red nation and a blue nation. We're headed that way. And again, the moment that happens, I mean, you know, some of the, I was telling you about David French and some of the fictitious scenarios he's setting up in his book, Divided We Fall. He says, what do you think? When America splits into two or three different nations, you know, uh, he's got red nation, Number one, he's got uh, blue nation, number two, and blue nation, number three. He's got the possibility of, of three different nations that, that, that all emerge. What, you think, you think like Russia's not going to make a move once America is dissolved and is no longer the most powerful nation in the world? You think China's not going to make a move? You think the Islamic fundamentalists aren't going to make a move? So let me say this. Those of you who want your Republican way, your Democratic way, I just have one word for you. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> because you're not going to get what you want. You're going to get what you want. Separate nations, but again, weaker nations. And you know, I think there's some people who would be fine with that. And if, 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 if they're fine with that and that's how God works it out, so be it. But that is not the intention of the founding fathers. Everybody wants to talk about the intention of the founding fathers. Let me tell you one thing that the founding fathers said. The founding fathers were greatly afraid of political parties becoming factions, not working together. So, the Lord catches the wise in their own craftiness. So, so, so the Lord turns then as the, the, the documents are unsealed and the Lord now gives the inheritance to the saints of the Most High, the holy ones become saints. And see, the point that I was going is, I said the president used to be the most powerful man in the world. And even if he remains, whoever he is, even if he remains, or whoever she is, who, who, whoever the president is, um, even as the most powerful person in the world, this doesn't compare with Jesus. Not even close. And if, the, if you begin to think in terms that this most powerful man in the world can get you somewhere, just, just if, 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 if we just have that party's platform running the show, if you think that, that's the opposite of what it means to be a holy one. That is an unsaintly perspective. 
The saints see the holiness of the Lord, that he is the only one who can accomplish God's purposes in the earth. And if there is something that is going to take place in the earth, in this nation, in the church, in this, these, the upcoming season, the upcoming years, it's going to be a revelation of the Holy One. And the Holy One means the only one. The only one. Now the only one gives the inheritance to the saints of the Most High. And then the saints of the Most High go out and they complete. They complete the ministry of Jesus. Jesus sets it in motion and then he gives it to the saints and says, Now you finish it. Now what does that mean, you finish it? All it means is we're going back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. When God created man, this is what he said. I'm making you in my image and my likeness go and take dominion. Go and rule and reign in the earth as my vice regents, as my co-regents. I don't need you to accomplish my plans in human history, but you need me to enable you to finish my plans because you're my sons, you're my daughters, and we're going to do this thing together. See, Adam, you know, the man and the woman mess it all up. They sin, they decide... They're going to be their own gods. And that means they're going to decide what's right and wrong and what's true and false and what's holy and what's not holy. They're, they're, going, to, they're going to determine what is ultimate reality on their own without God. They mess it up. And then Jesus, well, God... Jesus in the Old Testament is the angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament. God, one by one by one. All right, let's try it now with Cain and Abel. Ah, didn't work. Let's try it now with, uh, you know, let's try it now with the, uh, the nations of the earth. Ah, didn't work. Let's try it now with Noah. Oh, didn't work. Let's try it now with, uh, uh, I mean, let's try it now with letting people live six or seven hundred years. That oh, didn't work. Let's try it with Abraham. Maybe. Okay, now Abraham has all these children. Isaac, maybe. Jacob, maybe. Israel, that eh, doesn't work. Doesn't work. And then Jesus comes. Ah. It works. And then, as he says, because I live, you will live also. How, it was quoted today in the communion, how shall we work the works of God? Believe on him whom the Father has sent. See, that's the holy one and the true one. And that's how you become saints. When it comes down to, nah, it's not about America being a Christian nation. No, nah, that's, that's not. It's about Jesus. Amen. It's not about some big shot apostle or prophet. No, nah, it's about Jesus. It's not about some, you know, person who you wonder, you know, if they're really human beings or not. I mean, I, I've, I've always, forgive me, my, I love my brother, I've always really questioned if Steve Fado is really a human being or not. I, I think Steve Fado is an alien plant. Okay. I mean, I, there are people out there that I'm impressed with. I'm impressed with Steve Fado. Keith Hazel was off the charts. Off. I mean, like, like, in such a, a prophetic realm that even people that to me nowadays look like pretty valid prophets, it's like, yeah, but man, did you ever see Keith Hazel? Amen. But they're, they're still, it's, it, they're, they're human beings. Fado is a human being, okay? Keith was a human being. It's about Jesus. And guess how the saints are going to do it? Verse 9, fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar 
the souls of those who had been slain. See, the lamb is the lamb who'd been slain. It really, the Greek is more like the lamb who'd been slaughtered. And it's, it's a little, that's like a little more, <laughs> yeah, it's more graphic. It's got a little bite to it. But, but what he sees is not the lamb on the throne who was slaughtered, whose blood was, was caught in the, the basin at the base of the altar of his cross, and then he took it to heaven. But now he opens the fifth seal, and he saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And that's this, this theme that runs through Revelation. So how is the church going to complete the mission of Jesus in the earth? Well, they're going to bear witness to the word of God. They're going to, they're going to, they're, they, they have a testimony which they hold. Remember the church in Philadelphia, let no man steal your crown. See, the Lord gives us a crown and we're to hang on to it. See, it isn't even that we have to make our own crowns. It's just we receive a crown from Jesus and our job is to hold on to that crown. And you know how we hold on to the crown? We bear witness to Jesus. It was like what what Pastor Rob was doing today. I mean, we're in the midst of all this sickness, all this, this crazy stuff that's going on, all this division, all the, it's just, it's, I've never seen anything like it. And each day, it's like, what's going to happen today, Jesus, that's going to make it worse? And boy, I'm get, getting plenty of that. But in the midst of all of it getting worse, it gets punctuated by miracles from Jesus. Yeah. See, that's what it means to hang on to the crown. Just, just be faithful. Okay, yeah, okay, five bad things, one good, one miracle. The bad things outweigh the miracle, but hang on to that crown. Let no one steal your crown. So now the, they're, they're, what makes a martyr a martyr is they hang on to their testimony and they're faithful to the word of God. That's all. Again, doesn't, it doesn't take rocket science to be a pastor. It's simple. Hey, you need to see Jesus more clearly. And it doesn't take rocket science to be a martyr. No. As for me and my house, we'll believe the testimony of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? Yeah. We're going to believe in the testimony of the Lord. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true. See, there's holy and true. The holy and true one who gives the keys of David to the church in Philadelphia is the holy and true one who produces martyrs. Martyrdom is the ultimate authority. Now, I just said it wasn't like um, the force be with you, but, but, but it was like Obi-Wan. I mean, go back to the very... I mean, those of you who were even alive then... Go back to the very first Star Wars. Obi-Wan's fighting Darth Vader, and he shuts off his sword. And Darth Vader, whoo! And then he steps on his cloak. He's gone. I got him. I won. But Obi-Wan turned it off and said, I'm going to be more powerful as a martyr than I am beating the crap out of the devil. Powerful. I mean, that image... It's got to sink deep into our hearts. Bearing witness to Jesus is the way the church completes the kingdom mission of Jesus. Bearing witness to Jesus with our lives, with our death. Bearing witness to Jesus. How long, O oh Lord, holy and true until you vindicate till you judge and vindicate our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And by the way, you know, revelation is about mercy and judgment. I mean, the, the one thing that you can't deny about the whole New Testament, the gospel, it's about mercy and it's about judgment. I mean, Jesus is primarily about mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment, James says. The James, the brother of Jesus, says that in his epistle. But there is judgment. And if you really read, like if you're, again, I'm, I'm 
trying to teach, I say, I'm teaching you how to read the book of Revelation because it's very important to read it right now. We need to read it correctly. You know, you got the seven seals, you got the seven trumpets, and you got the seven bowls, the seven vials, the seven cups that are poured out. That's the final judgment that's poured out, and it starts in Revelation 15 and Revelation 16. That's final judgment. The seals and the trumpets speak of judgment, chastening, discipline, for God to get people to repent. But there are those who will not repent, and judgment comes on them. So what happens? Well, in chapter, at the end, I'm just... You can look at this later. The, there are two harvests in, in Revelation 14, at the end of Revelation 14. There's a wheat harvest and there's a grape harvest. And that's the picture of the whole agricultural uh, year. It's the, the, the three great feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, were, they were just harvest festivals. They, started, they were harvest festivals that the Lord put religious significance and meaning into it. The early harvest is the barley harvest. That's Passover. 50 days later, the wheat harvest. And by the way, there's an ascending value in these harvests. Barley is valuable, but not as valuable as wheat. And then the final harvest at the end of the year, that's your grapes, your olives. I mean, that's, that's your, your really rich, valuable stuff. Well, the two harvests that take place at the end of chapter 14, one is a harvest of wheat and the other is a harvest of grapes. And so you've got the whole, well, it's a harvest of grain and a harvest of, of, of grapes. So it's the whole, the whole cycle is set in motion in, in chapter 14. The, Lord, the Lord's going to harvest the grain first and then he's going to harvest the the, the grapes, well, the grapes then are, are pictured, when the grapes are crushed to make wine, it's, it's pictured as blood. And the blood that's taking place in chapter 14, see, guys, this, it's a central concept to the book of Revelation. I, I think there, there, are, there are reasons why a lot of people don't want to understand Revelation, because what Revelation does, it says it's the, the key to salvation in human history was martyrdom, the martyrdom of Jesus. The key to the establishing of God's kingdom in the earth by the church is martyrdom. This time, martyrdom of the church. See, see that's the book of Revelation. So the blood that's, that the, the grapes become blood at the end of chapter 14, that blood is taken into the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle, whereas with Jesus, his blood was taken in. Now it's the blood of the martyrs is taken in. And then the angels come out with seven cups, seven bowls, seven vials. And they pour them one at a time on the earth. They pour the blood of the martyrs on the earth. And then all this stuff is set in motion because of the blood of the martyrs. The blood of the martyrs is what brings ultimately God's kingdom in the earth. All our brothers and sisters that have gone before us in martyrdom, all of them, for all these centuries, that blood is being collected and then it's going to be poured out on the earth. And that's, that's, that's what sets in motion God's judgment. And when you read it, it's, it's people who aren't repenting, and it's Babylon, and it's the beast, and it's the false prophet who want to destroy God's people. Now, we've got to understand there, there are three categories of, 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 of human beings. Okay, there, there, there are believers. There are most of the rest of the people in the world who are not believers, but who are just people. They're just everyday schmucks like the rest of us. And all of those people have the potential to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. And that's, see, our job is to, is like Isaiah 49, the servant. He's going to bring Jacob back to the Lord and he's going to bring the nations to the Lord. But see, there's a third category. 
The third category are those people like Hitler and Stalin and Idi Amin. That, that's, that's my, I don't know why those three. I always say it, probably an old Bob Dylan song or something in the back of my head that put, you know, it was, uh, it was Abraham, Martin, and John, you know, was Dion. And, and, and then you got, I know somewhere it must have been Stalin, Hitler, and Idi Amin. I can't remember the song, but at any rate. But those people are devilish. They're wicked. They have no intention of doing anything but fighting against God, against God's purposes, against God's people. And they, that they represent the beast, they represent the false prophet, they represent the great harlot. And it said, because they drank the blood of the saints and the apostles and the prophets and those who fear God, well then, blood is going to be given to them to drink. And there is a, that, that's a category. And again, it's above my pay grade to say who's in that category, except for Hitler, Stalin, and Idi Amin. It's above my pay grade, and they're gone anyway. So, I mean, you can kind of, well, they're gone, you know, and that doesn't look to me like they went out on good terms with God. But for people who are alive now, they're, they're all part of that middle group. Schmucks who are, 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 have the potential to come to Jesus. And that's another reason why I don't care who's president, whether you like what he or she says or not. It's just a schmuck that has a chance to be redeemed by the Lord. And I pray for every single president. Again, I don't care what their policy is. I don't care what their, their you know, this, that, or the thing. They, they, they could turn out to be a Hitler, Stalin, and an idiot. I mean, I get that. I understand that. But until, I mean, as long as there's breath in them, I mean, remember Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, you talk about the ultimate narcissist. He was the ultimate narcissist. I'm the head of gold. Daniel said it. I'm going to bring Daniel in and, and as my prayer team and let Daniel pray over me as I rule the world viciously and narcissistically and do what I want because that's the kind of leader I am. The Lord says, eh, let's see. And then you find him eating grass like an ox on all fours, definitely a schmuck, I mean, and he grows hair out. I mean, he, what he is the picture of is the, and you look at the old commentators like Kyle and Delich, you know, from the 19th century, the, like, he had lycanthropy, okay? He was a wolf man, okay? He became a werewolf, you know, lycanthropy, which is actually a, a, a physical disease. And right. Mary, Mary Jo or somebody else can teach us on it someday. And he's on all fours in the field with lycanthropy, and the Lord comes, and he sees the Lord, and he says, forgive me, Lord. I'm not the head of gold. I'm not the most powerful man in the world. I'm just a schmuck. And you, Lord, are the true one, the God of Daniel. Darius, the king of Persia, would say, oh, my gosh. I mean, Persians, you know, <laughs> they, were, they were cool. I mean, they kept lions, you know, like they, they, they kept lions as their pets, you know, and didn't feed them and fed people to them when, when, when it, it suited their will. And Daniel goes down into the lion's den, and Darius is watching. The lions become little kitty cats, purring, you know, which I said, beasts don't purr unless the Lord tames the beast. And the Lord's taming beasts in the book of Revelation, just as he was with Daniel. So, that's the point I was making about presidents and so forth. Pray for your leaders. We're commanded in the word of God. You are commanded to pray for them. You, 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 if, if, if they're doing something that's not of God, you're free to say what they're doing is not of God. But pray for them that they have an encounter with God while they're in office. 
Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. When the bowl fills up, when there's enough blood to fill seven bowls that can be tipped. See, this whole thing about tipping bowls, you know, we, we always want to, we want to pray to tip the bowls. Do you understand what tipping the bowls means? Tipping the bowls doesn't just mean that healing is released. Tipping the bowls means that judgment is released. So I'm going to close. I've already spent such a long time. But let me close with the saints and truth. Just a couple, I'm going to read a couple verses just to show you. Revelation 11:18, and we said that a if you want to know the main theme of the book of Revelation, I've taught it on Sundays and the Wednesday night Bible study, the 1115 is the main theme of the book of Revelation. The seventh angel sounded, there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then when the Lord does all this, verse 18 says, the nations were angry, your wrath, O Lord, came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time came for the Lord to pay, to give rewards to his servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name small and great, and to destroy the ones who destroy the earth. The, the, there's always a trinity of, of persons. Here it's the prophets, the saints, and those who fear the name of the Lord. So the saints are right there with the prophets and those who fear the name of the Lord when the kingdom is established in the earth. 137 the beast emerges. There's the sea beast and the land beast, which we know as the beast or the antichrist and, and the false prophet. And it says that it was granted to the beast, in verse 7 of Revelation 13, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Now, remember... The Lord allows evil to appear to have won so that he can manifest himself powerfully. Then it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. This, this thing that's going on in the body of Christ, we've got to take up arms and we're patriots because you know our rights are being taken from us and violated. Well, here's what Jesus says in the book of Revelation. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. If you try to dominate people, you will be dominated. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. If you take up arms... You're siding with the, the way the beast does things and not the way the Lord does things. And look what trying to dominate people, control people. And again, this thing about, you know, we're going to legislate morality. Well, you, they're legislating immorality. You're not, we're not going to legislate anything. That's trying to control human beings. That's human beings trying to control other human beings. That's not the way God does things. Notice what it's contrasted with. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the who? The saints. The one who sees, those who see Jesus as the only one. In 1412, this is in the midst of, uh, um, uh, just before those two harvests that are taking place in uh, chapter, uh, verses 14 through 16, uh, of chapter 14, that's the two harvests I were, was referring to earlier, once again, and it's in light of the fact that, um, you know, the mark of the beast has taken place in, in 14 verse 9, uh, Babylon is going to be, uh, Babylon is going to be judged, uh, the great harlot is going to be judged, and that's in 14.8, 
And then it says in 1412, once again, here is the patience, the perseverance of the saints. And then it describes what the perseverance of the saints are. What do you mean, Pastor, as we're supposed to persevere? Here are those who keep the commandments of God. We obey the word and we keep the faith of Jesus or the faithfulness of Jesus. The holy ones aligned with the truth of the Lord, bearing witness to the truth of the Lord. The holy and the true ones are the ones who fulfill the kingdom purposes of the Lord and help finish his work. Thank you, Father. Lord, we took a long time, about an hour or so, and, uh, but we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we are, are, are looking to be saints of the Most High God. Empower us with a vision of Jesus, Lord. We know that it is walking in this holiness and truth that you're going to give us keys to lock and unlock, keys to bind and loose. We will talk about that, Lord, perhaps next week. In Jesus' name, we pray it. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord.